welcome to our special session on planetary health for World Health Day 2022. Today the WHO is calling us to act on a specific subset of recommendations set on its website for its campaign, Our Planet, Our Health. It calls on governments, citizens, healthcare professionals and corporations to take action. Today we're having a discussion session to try to better understand how can we actually put those recommendations in practice by focusing on interdisciplinary collaboration, health and economic co-benefits, and accountability. My name is Olena Zotova, I'm a Canadian medical doctor and Masters of Public Health candidate here at Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And I'm also the founder of the Quebec Sustainable Health Network, known as Réseau d'Action pour la Santé Durable du Québec in French, which mobilizes healthcare professionals in addressing climate change and ecological issues. I am very happy to be joined today by Dr. Christina O'Callaghan and Dr. Lela Mellon. Dr. O'Callaghan is an environmental epidemiologist at ICE Global Institute and a professor at the Open University of Catalonia, uh, where she's leading a new master's degree on planetary health. Hello, Christina. Thank you. And I'm pleased to welcome also Dr. Lela Mellon, who is the executive director of the Planetary Wellbeing Initiative Framework here at Pompeu Fabra University. And she's also the associate, um, an associate professor of sustainability and business law at ESCI UPF Business School. Hi, Lela. Thank Hi. you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before we begin with asking some questions to our two planetary health experts here, I'd like to make sure that we all have a good understanding of what planetary health is, especially for those people who have heard this, this term for the first time. And if I may, may make a personal note here, the first time I realized the importance of planetary health was really by noticing how many patients at the hospital are sick because of the air that they breathe, the food we eat, the cities we live in, how we transport ourselves. And this made me really concerned as, as a, a, a training, a, a physician in training. So how does planetary health help us understand these issues? Christina, can you help us define planetary health? Yeah, well, there are several definitions on, on planetary health. Uh, one of the fir first ones that was proposed in the seminal paper published by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet Commission on, on planetary health defines planetary health as, as the achievement of health, well-being and equity worldwide uh, within the sustainable limits of, of the planet. And also, and importantly, through the integration of different uh, human systems. So political systems, economical systems, and, and social systems. Having said that in, in a much simpler way, planetary health means that human health and the health of the planet, so the health of natural systems, cannot be understood uh, separately. So basically in the last centuries, and especially in the last decades, the, the benefits or the improvement in, in global health have been uh, achieved through the exploitation of natural systems. And this has, has led to the current situation in which we are facing a climate and environmental crisis that it put, it's putting at risk our health. So basically, from, from now on, uh, any, any benefit or any, any action to improve our health has to take into account uh, the health of, of the natural systems. So basically that's what planetary health is it's about, understanding that the health of the humans cannot be understood separately from the health of, of the planet. This, these are very, very important considerations and it actually makes us very concerned as healthcare professionals all around the world because we see that the same factors that are driving the high burden of chronic diseases are, and many other health issues are also driving issues that are making our planet sick, right? And this even challenges our ability to sustainably heal our patients from inside the hospital, right? It makes us want to get involved beyond the hospital to address some of those issues. Yes. So today, the WHO is calling us to act together for planetary health. And the solutions that the WHO is proposing to improve people's health and the health of the planet altogether are really focusing on um, issues such as divesting from fossil fuels, right? Having more sustainable diets, healthier diets, um, pri prioritizing uh, sustainable transportation, public transportation. And yet all of these actions have been very challenging to implement over the last years, right? Because a lot of governments, corporations, and professionals work in silos, work within their, their respective disciplines. So how can we be inspired by planetary health and try to act interdisciplinary um, in, in, in planetary health? 
Well, I would relate to many challenges that you already mentioned um, by saying what we need is to shy away from clinical approaches. So, like you mentioned, having a patient in the hospital is something else and curing him than actually having him back there in his own environment and his own lifestyle, trying to make sure he doesn't come back into the hospital. So that's where the change happens. And this has a lot to do with mindfulness. Um, thinking outside of the box, so even if the solutions are available, how to take them and integrate them in a mindful way individually but also collectively right that's where the challenges are so even when we change the structures from inside the internal change needs to happen too being of course facilitated and supported by outside structures by the way we create our cities by the way we are leading our lives by the way at the end of the day how labor law is implemented whether we do work eight hours per day or not so we also have the topic of how to reconcile family life with a personal one that you have time to take the healthy decisions you're supposed to take um, that's where the challenge lies. So it's not just breaking the silos interdisciplinary, but also how to translate the knowledge from science to be implemented in practice. That's where we're facing the biggest barriers right now. So something is the recommendation, specifically when we're speaking about divesting from oil and gas, it's a beautiful story, but it's not happening. So if that doesn't happen, what's the plan B? How can we make our life more sustainable? And since majority of the negative sustainable impact happens inside the cities, reforming the cities is one way of going. Um, understanding that if you do take this approach, which is very difficult, of mindfulness, of individuals being capable, actually empowered enough to take their individual decisions, then you also need to have accessible health care. Um, speaking in terms of Europe, we are way better than the general average globally in terms of access to healthcare, but we're nowhere near the optimal yet. So if somebody is mindful enough to understand the changes in his behavior and his health, how to get access to appro appropriate and effective immediate care that will prevent the, prevent the worst. And then, at the end of the day, the education to not do the same mistakes anymore. And this education goes way beyond being in a hospital or the chats we have basically in terms of science right scientists amongst ourselves um, so education long term combined with this mindfulness is where the impact is going to happen and intrinsically help to break the silences that exist because once you start thinking in that way that there is beyond the science you're studying into that's where cooperation happens and silences break so that would be my take on so, it. So, Christina, you're actually involved in education. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, well, completely agree on, on Lila's comment, but I think that the role of education is especially important in, in leading this, uh, this change. Um, I think a first step would be to raise awareness about uh, scientists and, and disciplines that might not be directly or might have not been directly uh, called by, by those challenges. So the, the challenges we face are, as, as you mentioned, so diverse and, and complex that cannot be solved Sorry, just uh, by people working, for instance, in environmental sciences or even not by people working in environmental sciences and health. We do need the involvement of other disciplines such as economists, people in social sciences or engineers uh, to, to, mention, to mention a few. So basically promoting, uh, well, ra raising awareness about, about these, these communities is very, very important. And I think uh, a potential or, or yeah, a possible solution for that or to start uh, moving in that direction would be the inclusion of a planetary health subject in all degrees, uh, regarding on, no? regarding on, on the on the topic and not only in all degrees but also in different levels of education starting as as early as in primary in primary school and to add on that uh, well <laughs> we hear very often the need of having interdisciplinary and trans transdisciplinary educational problems uh, uh, problems programs the, the problems we face are super complex and obviously they will not be solved just by one discipline, as, as I said, and we need this, uh, this clear interaction. But then when you face to uh, universities and quality uh, agencies, uh, they are still very reluctant to, to get involved or to approve these, these programs. And this is in fact one of the problems we, we had, or the challenges we, we had when trying to implement the, the new masters, the, the WOC, UPF and IS Global Masters on, on Planetary Health. Uh, one of the main criticisms or uh, or caveats we were uh, we were we were uh, aware of uh, would be 
the, the difficulty in giving students a deep level uh, of, of education in, in specific topics uh, rather than, than a shallow overview on, on different areas. But I think it's very important that we face this, this challenge and, and we promote this kind of, of programs. Yeah, definitely. So this, th these are very important challenges that educa educators all around the world are, are currently facing and even in, in the medical field with a recognition of the need to integrate more climate change uh, related topics and topics related to planetary health. So hopefully we'll see some more advances with people like you over the next years also who are, who are working on this, right? Now, the WHO is, is also emphasizing the need to recognize an economy of well-being, right? And yet, for many, many years, when we talk about health in all policies and, and focusing on well-being, the extent of the transformation required in our societies feels paralyzing to many people, right? It feels paralyzing in corporations because it really challenges our underlying assumptions about the world with which we have functioned over the last years, right? So how do you think leaders can turn this paralysis into action? And yes, how, how do you think we can do this, Leila? Um, I would say that first a careful and balanced approach is needed. Um, we need to talk about the urgency of action, but this is leading to the action paralysis, right? At the end of the day, the more we keep on saying, it's the last year, it's the last year, we need to do it, the less it functions. So, but if you make an informed approach of saying, these are the scientific facts, this is the window that is open to us, these are the actions that are available to us, this is what we can do. This is the first step towards empowerment. So it gives you the signal of there is something that can be done. This is the framework in which it can be done. And much of it was already done in one way by the information tra translation at the end of the day from non-governmental organizations, but also from some government governments in general. Um, where I see the problem here is in putting too much responsibility on individuals. And this is something that is maybe counterintuitive. We don't speak much about it. But repeating constantly, the consumer is the one who should do something, or singular company is the one that should do something, if it's a small or medium-sized one, is counterproductive in the sense that the system doesn't allow you to be very forward-looking right now. It doesn't support, in general, a system for individual, for instance, the institutions that are supporting our family life versus professional life, the institutions that are created to protect our health in terms of the food that is available to us. We have an issue with that. Why do I say it? Because you're on the go all the time, frankly. It depends a bit on the city, but the biggest cities in Europe, you're on the go constantly. The alternatives available to you are not very sustainable, neither in environmental sense, neither in social sense, and even less so in the sense of health. Yeah. Um, so changing those institutions I see as a precondition for empowering people to actually do something. And that relates to the individual level, to the individual consumer, but also private or public organizations. Until the system is a little bit more supportive towards sustainable practices and something that relates to general well-being, either in terms of health, either in terms of planet itself, I wouldn't put too much responsibility on people and institutions that actually do not have a plan B. So that would be my first way of action of saying, create institutions that support decision-making that at the end support sustainability and well-being. Right, right. And what do you think about this, Christina? I not much to add to, to Lila's uh, comment. I yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, just to mention that the importance of leaders to transmit also hope. Uh, I think obviously the situation we face is really scary. Uh, I mean, it's it's a crisis. It's an environmental crisis and also a health crisis. But if you feel there's no time to do anything or no, no room for improvement or to avoid uh, a, a very no, a, a, a terrible health crisis, uh, then you wonder what's the point of changing the way I live. No? Uh, so it's important that leaders and that we also transmit that there is uh, hope, there is room for hope and there is room for, for a change that leads us to a, to a better situation. I think this is very important. Of course, um, adding to this message, the importance of urgency. Okay, there is hope, but we need to move no, quick. Yeah. No, it's not something that we can hope for a change in 10 years. No, we need to start changing right now. And what I, what I found that helps with this transition of this feeling of move, but not a negative one that we need to, is creating the sense of community or bringing it back. It was present before. And that's why I, I feel it's so important to, to keep on noting local action for global results. 
it's the local communities that we can connect first. Through the local ones, there is a certain connection at the regional level. Through that connection, you again have this national, if nothing else, pride and community and, and pertaining, belonging to somewhere yeah. that drives us. We lost that and we kind of lost that hope. And I think with building those communities, exactly what you're doing right now, that's giving you hope because you have like-minded people around you and there's no more solitude, isolation. What can I do? I'm just one. All of a sudden, you're not just one. And this is something that I welcome a lot in this context, uh, context of urgency. We can do it kind of I together. I think the empowering citizens in, in that regard and involving them in the, in the finding and implementation of solutions it's an yes. it's an important an important bit definitely so some of the solutions that the who emphasizes as a matter of fact are focusing on some of the uh, economic co-benefits and health co-benefits that we we can achieve together if we are actually able to implement them uh, as a community right yeah. And now that we have seen throughout the pandemic how economies around the world have suffered from the pandemic, leaders are, are pondering where should they be investing their money, right, to, to maximize those economic co-benefits and health co-benefits um, after the pandemic. So how do you think uh, we, we can achieve those co-benefits and where should we put our money? Lele, if you want to give, give, give <laughs> yeah, us your I thoughts the, about I was this. the one who has the most to comment on it, yeah. Um, Look, first let's let's start talking about economic benefit in general. Um, economic benefits should and are interpreted in the framework of the prevalent institutions the way they are in the system, economic one, the social one, etc., the political one at the end of the day. Um, so how we're measuring at the end of the day the economic progress and growth is completely dependent on the context in which we find ourselves. So to be able to answer to you in terms of economic benefits, First of all, us measuring it in terms of GDP and yeah, the benefits that we get from investing in a specific company turned, it backfired on us, right? Because we didn't implement the same costs and benefits as we should in terms of not just money, but the environmental concerns, the cost, the inputs that we were getting free of charge from the mother nature, well, they're not actually free of charge. And we were basing all of it on the assumption of zero limits to the natural resources. We made it wrong. So now if we talk about economic benefits, um, we should redefine it to start talking about what it is. The fact is, even in our current economic framework, to, to shy away a bit from the philosophy that we're doing it wrong, even in the current economic framework, it has been proven repeatedly with empirical research that it actually pays off to invest sustainably. It pays off to invest in green solutions. It even out, outperforms the non-green solutions in medium term, which is great already. The problem is we're still so attached in the short term solutions, we don't integrate those findings in the business surrounding. And that's something that I'm very sad about because it's been proven repeatedly that medium term and long term, sustainable companies actually outperform and heavily. So now this would be good to be translated actually to the business environment for them to start using it and also as a way of avoiding climate risk, which has become in a business sense, a real risk that is being calculated now on a daily basis. So I would say start investing green, if nothing else, to avoid the climate risk that is starting to enter your annual accounts at the end of the day. Right. Thank you for this. And Christina, would you have anything to add about those, yeah, those economic uh, benefits? Yeah, just to complement the, the point that Lela was, was commenting on about the short term and the long term benefits. Uh, well, of course, uh, changing to or redefining our economy or adapting mitigation strategies would require an initial investment. However, there, are, there is increasing evidence that this will pay off uh, by reducing the costs of treatment of, of diseases. For instance, there is a nice example of a paper published a few years ago by Mark and I, uh, uh, and colleagues uh, showing that the investment in mitigation strategies uh, to achieve the, Paris, the, the reduction in emissions uh, set in the Paris Agreement under different scenarios uh, would lead to, to health uh, co-benefits. So basically, under, under most of the, of the scenarios uh, analyzed, uh, the reduction of diseases that they would, that they would uh, cause or that, that they would lead uh, would, would translate into a, a reduction in the costs for the health system that would pay off the, the initial investment in, in implementing those, those strategies. Definitely. And to add uh, that on your specific question on where should we be yeah. investing, if, if we can answer this, this question, 
I think clearly the investment in moving towards uh, clean sources of energy or yes. green sources of energy, that would be a, a, a clear uh, priority. I mean, we know that uh, the burning of fossil fuels, which uh, is sadly the still uh, the, 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 base, the basis of, of our economic system, uh, is the main cause of the climate crisis and also of environmental pollution. And we are not, we don't have reliable uh, figures yet on mortality and morbidity associated to climate change, but this is very well studied for pollution and we know that the pollution causes more than 7 million deaths annually and it's responsible for more than 20% of global uh, morbidity. So by, by moving to clean sources of energy, we are not just uh, dealing with those health problems, but also uh, stopping or mitigating the, the climate crisis we are facing. Definitely. This, this really sounds essential for, for health and it's not, it not only sounds essential, it is it essential. Is, it is essential. And it has been demonstrated to have very important health co-benefits that thereby improve health um, subsequently. And overall, we're really trying to shift gears in our societies to think more in a public health perspective, right? Where we want to prevent diseases from happening as much as possible and not only rely on hospitals after all to treat the, the, the rising burdens of diseases which we are already facing the, the, the challenge of treating, right, to some extent. So. And preventing in economic terms is way more affordable for the state too than, yeah. than, than exactly. resolving. So I think we really kind of misconstrued some of our policies in understanding of how much money could also be saved and reinvested in some kind of other sustainable solution by shying away from the current system. So I think we have some space there to, to play with policy making still. Yeah, definitely. So now that we have realized this, uh, how can we hold each other accountable? So the WHO is telling us to come together, hold each other accountable, and this is why we are building action networks for healthcare professionals, for business leaders for all kinds of people right to come together and, and work together in those communities that you were mentioning Leila. Now what are some concrete actions that citizens can actually do to hold their governments accountable, to hold their corporations accountable in caring for planetary health? This is a very complex question because um, again it's a problem of collective action at the end of the day but not only that it's a problem of collective action and individual disempowerment in the current system the way it is, it is. We have, right now, the new generations, this feeling of helplessness to a certain extent that translates to anger at the end, which also works because we have Extinction Rebellion and to a certain extent it works. Um, what has been working for us up until now in this change of mentality from disempowered to a little bit empowered is the work of NGOs. Why do I say that? Because they have been in the last decade, the main translators from scientific findings into common language. And that helps because misinformation is also a disease that we're suffering right now in the 21st century. And NGOs are trying to do their best in preventing the misinformation and actually just sharing the information the way it is. Um, empowering people means giving them the right information at the right time and giving them this hope that they can act. Um, this is the first thing that should happen, facilitate the translation of scientific findings into something that is understandable to people and then reminding them that together collectively they are strong they're strong enough to be able to influence um, the decision makers if nothing else by their prohibitive actions what do I mean um, not only strikes in general because this is something that is very strong in Catalonia right and it works um, but in general shying away from less green options. What do I mean by that? It's just a crazy little silly example of electricity in Spain. You can opt for 100% green one or you can opt for a mix. Frankly, the competition right now in our market made the green affordable. Frankly, a lot of times more affordable than the one that provides from oil and gas. Sharing information to people about that spurs the demand for the green electricity. What happens in the market when you spur the demand for green electricity? We can furnish it to the amount that we have right now in Catalonia. I'm not saying in global terms. We can furnish that green electricity. You informing about those facts in an unbiased manner empowers. That's the first thing that we need to do. Go towards empowerment and using the power that the NGOs have. Um, second of all, for you to be able to act on those things, once again, I'm just going back to the institutions. Governments should be forced, if nothing else, to provide the correct institutions. If nothing else, 
through joint public forums. We're not as powerless as we seem, but if we're silent, we are. Um, and then, Christina, I'm going to let you finish with your comment that we were just having a discussion in here um, about the power that we actually have to decide who is the decision maker. So Yeah, I think uh, some people uh, are in general, there is this bit tiredness of feeling responsible for individual change where institutions are not doing much. No, I think especially youth have this, as Leila was, uh, was pointing out, this anger of, okay, why do I need to change the way I live, being it so difficult, where the powerful or the companies are, are not doing anything. Uh, but I think it's important that we acknowledge that we as individuals uh, do have a play uh, do, have, do have a role to play in, in, in leading this change. And for instance, with the political actions uh, or the political choices we make, it, it may have an, an impact. Yeah. And the governments can, of course, provide the framework, as has been happening right now at the level of EU, where they demand sustainable corporate governance from the companies. But it's a framework. Then how that framework is going to be put in action, it's again up on the individuals. Yes, those individuals are called directors, fine, fair enough. But leadership doesn't stop there. So you're leading in every part of your life. You're leading as a mother, you're leading as a sister, you're leading as a member of a dancing group. Your actions matter and we forgot that. We only, we only see it like we lead where our signature says that we are directors. And that's the power that we carry as individuals. So that brings me straight back to what I said, mindfulness and mindful living and understanding that we do echo in one another. And that that has a lot to play with the changes happening right now. Definitely. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about leadership. This is very inspiring, I think, for, for people all around the world. And really thinking about how can we find our place, right, in, 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 in that movement for planetary health, as the WHO is calling on us to do governments, corporations, healthcare professionals, citizens, we all have a role to play after all. We just have to be aware that we already have a place. You don't have to search for it, just yeah, act just it out. Go, yeah. <laughs> I think once people realize that the urgency and the importance of the situation, uh, I mean, you cannot just sit and, and, and do nothing. Yes, I mean, if, they, if they realize the individual power they do have in their everyday lives, in the littlest things, that changes the game. It really does. Exactly. But not only focusing on the little things, also on the big things. Right? Exactly. At, at the political level, which is absolutely uh, essential, and the corporate level as well. All right. Well, today we discussed interdisciplinary action, right? Interdisciplinary leadership, what, what we believe is, is very important. We discussed how we can rethink our framing of uh, economy and, uh, and of health overall, right? And about finding our place in the end, each one of us with our roles in, in society for planetary health. So thank you, Leila. Thank you, Christina, for joining the thank discussion you, today. Thank you for organizing. This is only the beginning of the discussion, right? Only the beginning of this movement for planetary health, which is a relatively new discipline, as we understand. And as the WHO is calling us to action, we encourage you to review the recommendations posted on the website for World Health Day 2022. Share them with your colleagues, with your family, with your friends, and discuss how can you actually put them in, act in action in your communities where you live and where you work. Thank you for joining us today and let's act, let's act together for planetary health.